In this video, I'm going to let you know exactly why I think Liam Lawson was sacked from the Red Bull seat and why he got demoted to the V-Carb seat after only two races, only two races with the main Red Bull seat. I've seen something in his driving. I think it's got to do with the steering input on entry and the trail braking as well and the timing of the turn in. I've got my steering wheel next to me. I've got some onboard footage as well. We're going to get straight into it. So if you're interested in what my thoughts are, definitely keep watching. Welcome back to the channel guys. My name is Martin. I'm a specialist technical coach and mentor for open formula drivers. In this video, I'm going to tell you exactly why I think Liam Lawson has been struggling with the Red Bull with the help of some onboard footage as well. Now, a little bit of context, the way Max Verstappen likes to drive the Red Bull and how I think these modern day Formula One cars like to be driven is with very progressive steering inputs, a very smooth, one smooth sweeping arc of the steering wheel and trailing off that brake pedal pressure and then adding steering wheel perfect use of the friction circle which i'm going to draw out for you as well what i see liam do is turn it into the corner quite aggressively initially and that gives him troubles upsets the balance of the corner if i could just show you with the with the steering wheel here what max will do is and i'll i'll just um pretend we're breaking into a hairpin for example here we go do 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 and slowly add on steering and get it into the corner like that. I hope that makes sense to you guys. Whereas what Liam I see doing is like, do, 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 bang. And then the second phase of the steering input, for some reason, he just feels the need to add it all at once. What that's doing is allowing the front to slide across the track. You're essentially violating the friction circle rules. And I've got my own interpretation of the friction circle, which I'm going to draw for you now. And I'm going to explain to you why I feel like he's violating my interpretation of the friction circle. So why don't we do that now? Well, let's do the videos first, and then I'll show you guys the um, what's happening with the friction circle. All right, hopefully you can see that on the screen in front of you. Like I say, we've got a bunch of onboards. We're going to run through them together. It's going to play at normal speed and then slow speed. What I want you to watch for is the steering wheel straight, and then at, at some point, a big initial go of steering. Okay, so keep an eye out for that. This is the hairpin in China. There. So there was a pause, a pause there, and then bang, he just adds it all at once. It's not very progressive. Here's a comparison with Max. Max is on the left. You might have to watch this a few times. I'm going to slow it down. Max is on the left. He's already steering progressively. Liam has that pause and then has to feel the need to add the second half all at once. There, you can see it evident on the right. That's Liam on the right. Here's Mexico. He was overtaking Franco. And again, the steering, watch it just open and then bang, it all comes in at once. The double apex again. He just feels the need to get it in too much, I think. Here you go again, uh, too much initial, has to open for the rear and then has another second go at turning in. So look, I know that was um, fairly quick, guys. I know that was just like a, a, some flashes of information. Go back and watch it if you if you can and you'll see that there's a point at which he'll turn in too quick, realize maybe the backsliding open and then go again, or he'll just delay his turning in until the speed has come down, which means he's not turning in with downforce, crucially, when the downforce is active. And then feels the need to try to do it. It's not a bad technique for the wet, Liam, if you're listening, it's good for the wet. It's like a short corner V style approach, um, but it doesn't seem to be working. It's not a continuous smooth sweeping arc of the steering, keeping dynamic weight and aerodynamic platform stable. That's the most important thing. All right, let's jump over to the whiteboard where I will show you this, uh, the friction circle. And look, I've got my own interpretation for the friction circle. So don't hang me if this is wrong. I know it is wrong. I know the friction circle generates g-force but i just want the reason i have my own interpretation is so that i can teach you guys so this is the friction circle and it's again it's my interpretation you've got braking capacity here the steering capacity on one side steering capacity on the other side and traction slash throttle capacity down the bottom now when the steering wheel is straight 
crucially, you've got the most braking capacity. So that means you can push the brakes nice and hard with the steering wheel straight and get over to that braking capacity. Now it's called a circle, a friction circle, because it's it's circular in nature, right? You can't just come off one and go on the other. You can't square this circle. It has to be a beautiful, elegant trade-off between brakes now, trail braking, and steering input. So if we're turning into this right-hander, then load is going to be coming across this way. And what I want to highlight to you is what needs to happen is what Liam needs to do is come off the brakes and then add that in steering. Come off the brakes again and then add that in steering. Come off the brakes, add in steering. And you literally trade one for the other until you're totally off the brakes. And then Liam, at that very last point, you can give it the, the slightest amount of extra steering. But all up to this point, it has to be progressive. Now, we spoke about the cars being heavy. We spoke about aerodynamic platforms. We spoke about downforce being active. We spoke about weight distribution as well. These are all the factors that are contributing to what, what makes this successful, turning in with downforce and trading harmoniously off the brakes and with the steering. By doing what Liam's doing, Firstly, the front is unloaded at the point he's turning. It's a very late turn and it's a very sharp turn. What I see Liam doing here is a few different things. Number one, fine. Let's just say he, you know, breaking into the hairpin, he's got the steering wheel straight. He'll come off the brakes, come back down this way, but not begin to turn yet or turn very little. And then as he comes off the brakes even more, then you get this big steering input right at the end. Now, my unique interpretation of the friction circle is that you have to stay within it and a violation of the friction circle means that you're outside because one of the inputs has been too strong and you need to bring that back in. So it's like nothing or a little bit. So not using all of the available grip that is on over here on the entry when the downforce and speed is active, like we'll talk about. But then right at the end, the big armful of lock violating the friction circle, this means your fronts are sliding now at this point. Like I say, you can't strictly go outside, but my interpretation is when an input is too strong, you will fall outside just to tell you that that input needs to be come back in. So it needs to be more initial turning, but then continuous rate and not play around with uh, how quickly you're, you're, you're introducing the steering. It's got to be as smooth and as consistent as possible. So if I can just draw for you how downforce works, this is um, speed over here, and this is downforce over here. There's no downforce at zero kilometers, and then there's very little as you increase, but then the key speed there, that's where the, all the downforce is at the top end. So you want to turn in with that downforce, Liam. And what he's doing by delaying the turn in, the downforce is bleeding off and he's beginning to turn in with very little downforce. It's not how the car works. Now, these cars are very heavy, very mercurial in the front end. So actually, that's the other thing I wanted to explain to you is that in the slow speed, these cars have under, understeer tendencies. And in the high speed, when the aerodynamics is active, the balance shifts to oversteer. So Liam needs to recalibrate that whole situation. He's going to have to turn in at the right moment to be able to take advantage of that oversteer or healthy turn in. And then as the speed comes down, it's going to tend to understeer. That's when he can give it that right arm full of lock. It's just right at the very end of the corner. I think he's, there's a combination of things, but I think it's all got to do with the turn in, how he's using the downforce, how he's using the weight transfer, how he's using the trail braking. It's that entry phase. Now he's been coming on the radio complaining about exits as well, but everything is downstream of the entry, right? If the entry is wrong, you know, input garbage in, garbage out sort of thing. So if it's, if the entry is wrong, then his exit's going to be wrong as well. So if I was working with Liam, this is what I'd be working on would be the timing of the turn in, how much to turn in, when to turn in, and then how to add that steering and how to trail out of the brakes and then very progressively add the steering, knowing that these car cars aerodynamic platform is very sensitive, very mercurial. Now, look, was it the right thing for Red Bull to sack him after two races? Well, look, I'll answer that question in a second, but I've got an under, underlying philosophy that, these rookies are coming in without specialist technical driver coaches and mentors to dig them out of these situations when they invariably fall in those situations. 
like Behrman's crashed in Melbourne, Colapinto, many crashes, Antonelli crashed at the Parabolica. There is no one coming in saying, here's the goals and objectives. And if you do get into trouble, here's how we're going to dig you out. And there is no human element or even human slash technical element to that equation. One of the examples on the weekend in China was Hamilton asked his engineer, where am I losing time? And the engineer said, turn 13. And Hamilton said, yeah, you told me that already. Where am I losing time? And Lewis is not looking for the where. He's asking for help. Help me. I'm struggling. I'm losing lap time. Help me. I need to understand. I need insight. I don't just need delivery of information. It's turned, I need insight. Am I overstressing the tires in a particular corner that's having downstream implications over at turn 13? As it turns out, yes, Lewis's line into turn one was overheating the tires, having downstream implications down at the entry into turn 13. So these are the sort of insights which I think are missing in Formula One. Now to answer the question, does Liam deserve extra time? Yes, in the right hands with the right nurturing, I believe so, yes. In Melbourne, I believe he missed FP3 because it was some power unit issue and he didn't get a chance to undertake a complete weekend so i think i'd you know and he was thinking it was his first time at melbourne as well i could probably forgive him for that and then in china we, again i'm not sure if he's done the track before number one number two it was a sprint weekend with everyone having limited testing and so we're coming into suzuka now a track liam knows with a full normal grand prix weekend Give the guy a chance, number one, and give the guy a chance with the specialist technical coach and mentor to help dig him out of this situation and, like we spoke about, start to understand the why and the cause and effect and work through that. With, in the right hands and with the right amount of time, and Liam's got the right mentality, I think, which is that, you know, he he's definitely wants to improve and this is not where he wants to be. So then why wouldn't it be a success? Now, Checo got four years in that Red Bull of... Um, you would argue subpar performances. I don't think it's fair that Liam gets two races. Now, that's just my personal opinion on the matter. Guys, let me know if you enjoyed this video, learned something from it. If you agree with me that he deserves extra time or you disagree with me, I'd like to hear from you as well. If you like this video, subscribe to the channel. We've got Japanese preview coming up moving forward. Uh, definitely comment the video as well. That helps the channel move forward. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.